Welcome everyone to the KIAS Quadrant Centennial Lectures. So today's speaker is Professor Danny Caligari from the University of Chicago. And this is the second talk of in his uh, lecture series on sausages and butcher papers. So uh, Danny, would you start the lecture? Okay. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, so I uh, just want to check people can hear me and see my screen. Yeah. Okay. So I want to just sort of recall um, a little bit about what I was talking about um, last week. So we're talking about uh, certain kinds of uh, families of holomorphic dynamical systems. Basically, they were looking at polynomials, complex polynomials in one variable, and their iterates acting on the Riemann sphere. Um, and we're looking at a certain kind of subclass of polynomials, the so-called shift locus, so these are the polynomials um, of degree D up to conjugacy. So D is the some degree. Uh, polynomials of degree D up to conjugacy with the following property. So if you have a polynomial, you can look at the critical points, just the roots of the derivative of that polynomial. And you can ask uh, what happens to those critical points when you apply the polynomial to them uh, again and again and again. And so a polynomial is in the shift locus if for every critical point, the orbit of that critical point, when you apply the polynomial again and again and again, that critical point tends towards infinity. So if we normalize our polynomial to be uh, of the form z goes to z to the d plus uh, something times z to the d minus two to plus something times z to the d minus three plus dot dot dot, then we have uh, d minus one complex coefficients. So after conjugacy, we can always put it in that sort of normalized form. And so you can think of the shift locus as an open subset of d minus one dimensional complex space, or the shift locus in degree d is an open subset of d minus one dimensional space. Um, and so uh, I'm going to look at the moment, and for most of this talk, I'm going to concentrate um, on the case uh, d equals three, but just recall for d equals two, um, so this is a open subset of the complex plane, the shift locus in degree two is the complement of the ordinary Mandelbrot set. So we're going to sort of talk a little bit about um, the shift locus, we'd say something about topology um, in, in higher degree. So the shift locus in degree three, it's a complex two-dimensional manifold, it's an open subset of C2, um, and so its complement is, is some closed subset, a kind of higher dimensional analog of the Mandelbrot set. Well, it's hard to draw pictures um, of uh, two complex dimensional spaces, especially on your computer screen, um, and, and so real four dimensions. So um, this picture here on the right, uh, where my little arrow is moving around, is a slice, a one dimensional complex slice through the space of polynomials um, of degree three. So these are normalized polynomials, polynomials of the form z cubed plus pz plus q. Um, so you have two free parameters, two complex numbers, the coefficients p and q. So it's two complex dimensional. And this um, is a little picture of the one complex dimensional slice where the coefficient p is zero. So these are polynomials of the form z cubed plus a constant q. And so you're varying the value of the constant q. And this little sort of uh, beetle uh, in the middle in white is the complement of the shift locus. So the sort of slightly colored, tan colored region outside this bug is the part of the shift locus in degree three outside, um, uh, restricted to the one dimensional complex slice of the space of degree three polynomials, polynomials of the form z cubed plus um, uh, q. So of course, if you have a polynomial of the form z cubed plus q, um, there's exactly one critical point and it's zero. So that critical point either heads off to infinity or it doesn't. Um, and it turns out in that case that the collection of those uh, polynomials in this one dimensional slice is a kind of a, a like it's a connected object. It's uh, rather like the Mandelbrot set sort of uh, has the homotopy, check homotopy type of a point. We don't know if it's locally connected, but if it were, uh, we'd have the homotopy type um, of a point. So its complement is like an open annulus. Um, and if I click at a point in this open annulus um, over on the left, 
it's drawing a picture of the associated Julia set. So remember, to be in the shift locus turns out to be equivalent to saying that the Julia set, uh, the closure of the set of repelling periodic points of the polynomial F, that the Julia set is a Cantor set and the dynamics of the polynomial on that Cantor set is uniformly expanding. So you can sort of see, as I get very close to this white set, this Julia set on the, on the left, this um, Cantor set, so sort of starts to look kind of thicker and thicker and kind of, as I cross over, uh, the Julia set kind of becomes, it gets a sort of solid region uh, in the middle. Um, and as I move around outside um, this sort of little beetle, this Julia set, this Cantor set, goes through some interesting kind of motion in the plane. It braids around in some kind of interesting way and uh, traces out some uh, mapping class in uh, the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set, which is one of my favorite groups. Um, and so uh, this is all very nice. Um, and then I sort of told you last week how to make a kind of combinatorial model um, of one of these uh, uh, polynomials in uh, the shift locus uh, as follows. Um, there's a theorem of Butcher, which says that any polynomial, so Z goes to Z to the D plus small change, um, is holomorphically conjugate just to the map Z goes to Z to the D in some little neighborhood of infinity. And so, um, well, in a neighborhood of infinity, so you can foliate a little neighborhood of infinity by uh, lines uh, of uh, constant argument. So those are permuted by the map Z goes to Z to the D. And you can pull that those back uh, under this conjugacy, and then you can sort of pull them backwards undertaking pre-images of the map uh, F, and you can get a kind of singular foliation um, of uh, the complement of the Julia set by these sort of rays, this branch foliation, which is sort of the pullback of these rays um, over in the complex plane. So there's some little bit of numerical error here, uh, but hopefully you can see there's a kind of foliation here, a singular foliation. So these polynomials I just remarked, Z goes to Z cubed, plus Q, there's exactly one critical point, which is at the origin, so the center here, um, and the pre-images of those critical points. So that the, the, the critical point is a singularity of this foliation, and the pre-images of the critical point are also singularities, and the pre-images of the pre-images, and so on. And those sequence of pre-images nestle down uh, onto the Julia set, which is uh, honestly rather hard to sort of see in this picture. And as you kind of move around, these sort of family of rays uh, kind of vary in some interesting ways. And so you can think of this family of rays as giving you a kind of canonical coordinates um, on uh, the Fatou set, the complement of the Julia set, making it into a kind of a branched cover, so semi-locally branched cover um, of a kind of nice Euclidean um, uh, piece of Riemann surface, a piece of paper. Um, and so one way to obtain this Fatou set is by a kind of cut and paste. And I sort of indicated last time um, how, how there was a sort of a way of associating a kind of combinatorial gadget, a kind of dynamical lamination um, to, to uh, uh, an element of the Fatou set and such, such that if you sort of took the complement of the unit disc and did cut and paste along the sort of the parts of the leaves, the tips of the leaves of this lamination, you would get a Riemann surface on which Z goes to Z to the D was conjugate to uh, your polynomial F on its Fatou set. So there's this correspondence between polynomials in the shift locus and these combinatorial dynamical laminations. Um, so this is a one complex dimensional slice of a two dimensional parameter space. Um, just to sort of show that everything is a little bit weird, here's a two real dimensional slice of the two complex dimensional um, space. So this is the parameter space. These are polynomials of the form z cubed plus pz plus q, where now p and q are both real numbers. Um, and as you can see, uh, the uh, set, um, the, the complement of the shift locus in this sort of real two-dimensional plane uh, is not compact. In fact, it contains within it uh, the sort of the cusp, uh, uh, cusp curve minus four p cubed minus 27 q squared uh, equals zero, which after all is sort of uh, well, minus 27 p 
q minus one, excuse me, squared equals zero asymptotically, uh, the cusp curve q equals zero, uh, which is just the ordinary discriminant locus, which parameterizes um, polynomials uh, for which um, a critical point is fixed. So as we move around here, um, these rays have quite a, a different character. So now there are typically two distinct critical points, uh, neither with sort of multiplicity, um, and the picture is sort of very interesting. Um, so uh, also there's some sort of interesting dynamics. In, 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 in degree two, you may know that um, for a polynomial associated to a quadratic in the, the Mandelbrot set, the associated Julia set is connected. Um, so in, in degree three, however, that's sort of not true. And you can certainly find examples of uh, polynomials which are sort of in the complement of the shift locus, there's this white region here on the right, for which the associated Julia set is not connected. Um, and in fact, the Julia set can even be a Cantor set. So you can see here, it's kind of a Cantor set. So uh, uh, even, even though um, you sort of, uh, well, anyway, a lot of very interesting kind of dynamics here. So we kind of take a, a real positive number here, um, we can get a kind of, it's very hard to see. This is a problem with drawing a kind of an accurate picture of a Cantor set. It's sort of a, a, a nowhere interior and usually has measure zero. So if you draw a picture of it, it tends to look like nothing at all. Um, but if we draw the sort of the rays on it, you can kind of see uh, somehow that's sitting inside. I guess this is, I've, somehow the real axis has got turned on its side in this picture. So this is, this is actually uh, the real line here is, is containing, is uh, the, Cantor, the Cantor set contained in that. So this is a Julia set which is a Cantor set associated to a point, which is in this like little tip here. So it's not in the shift locus, but it is, um, does have a Cantor set, uh, Julia set. So one of the critical points is actually contained in that Cantor set and the other one heads off to infinity. Okay, so that's sort of like just a little bit of um, fun and games. Um, um, but I wanted to talk about, um, the uh, combinatorial side of things. And so the idea here is that um, when we, uh, under, under this sort of uh, uh, singular foliation, we kind of conjugating the action of our polynomial F on the FATU set to the action of Z goes to Z to the D um, uh, on the complement of the unit disk in the complex uh, plane, um, cut and paste, along a collection of these vertical sp spikes. And these vertical spikes correspond to the critical points, not just these critical, not just these vertical spikes, spikes, but also their pre-images. So I'm kind of drawing a bunch of pre-images there, but for the moment, let's just look um, at, the, at the kind of the critical leaves, okay? Um, and so the idea is that um, I'm, if I have a, a pair of these sort of spikes here um, corresponds uh, to a single critical point. So you have two points over here in the butcher coordinates correspond to a single critical point because the, the sort of the butcher map fails to be kind of locally injected exactly at these critical points. It's sort of one to two, if that makes sense. Um, and to indicate which two points are associated to the same critical point, we're joining them by a kind of chord inside the unit disk. So that thing inside the unit disk, it's just a kind of cosmetic thing. It's just there to indicate that this spike and this spike correspond to the same uh, critical point. And when we do this cut and paste, we cut. So we take the exterior of the unit disk, we cut along this red line here, we cut along this red line, and we glue the left side of this red line to um, the right side of this red line, and the right side of this red line to the left side of this red line. And we do the same with this, and we do the same with all the kind of pre-images of those. Okay. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to sort of show you now what happens as we move around in the shift locus, how these uh, kind of pictures change. So as I kind of uh, change, uh, I have, have a two parameter family, uh, two real parameter family of locations of the critical points. So here, one of my critical points I'm leaving fixed and the other one I'm just kind of moving around. And since it's a complex number it has sort of two degrees of freedom, so the spikes can get longer, that's one degree of freedom, or the spikes can kind of rotate. And since the argument between them is two pi over three, um, 
if one of the spikes rotates, the other one rotates along with it. So it's sort of just doing something like that. Um, and then sort of what's interesting is that the way these pictures work is we move around. So one of these guys is going to collide with the other, but then something very interesting happens. It kind of pops through to the other side. So you can sort of see what's happening here. One critical leaf, so to speak, is being pushed over the a bigger critical leaf. So there's this kind of uh, priority. These critical leaves are kind of uh, ranked according to how long they are. And when one of them bangs into the other, it sort of pushes the smaller one sort of pushes over the longer one. Well, what does that really mean? So what really means, what this really means is that this lamination is really just some data that helps you remember a Riemann surface. And the way you get the Riemann surface is you do this kind of cut and paste along each of these arcs. You kind of take the circle and pinch it along each of these arcs. And so the result is um, when you sort of pinch along one of these arcs, so you pinch along, say, the first arc, the circle gets pinched uh, into these two smaller circles. And then when I pinch along this second arc, this circle gets pinched into these two smaller circles. And now, as I move these things around, the sort of way in which these circles are moving around, it's continuous. And as I sort of push the smaller leaf over the bigger leaf, you can't sort of see what, there's no kind of effect, there's no discontinuity um, at the level of these circles, because um, these circles here are just telling you how this leaf is moving around in the circle that you get by pinching, by cutting along the bigger leaf. And so pushing over this leaf, it's kind of a discontinuity. It's like if we're looking at numbers, um, the integer part of a number, so numbers mod Z or something, we have 0 0.8, 0 0.9, goes 0 0.999, and all of a sudden we go to zero, it looks like a discontinuity, but there's not really a discontinuity in um, the, the real numbers mod the integers. So as we kind of push over the, the bigger curve, um, the location of the sort of the smaller leaf of the lamination in the circle modulo the bigger leaf varies continuously. And now if we sort of put in some of these uh, other leaves, you can sort of see that the smaller leaves just get out of the way of the big leaves as we move the big leaf around. Um, so the big leaves are moving at some speed and their, their pre-images are moving one third as fast because they're the pre-images under the max z goes to z cubed. So the argument of the red guy moves three times as fast as the argument of their pre-images. So because they're moving slower, the big guy can sort of push over them and they get out, they get pushed out of the way. Um, on the other hand, in this quotient picture over on the right-hand side, everything is varying kind of continuously, although it may not because of sort of numerical problems with the way my program is working, um, but hopefully it sort of will work. And as you kind of move things around, you sort of add sort of more and more pre-images, the thing sort of moves like that. And if you sort of added all the possible pre-images, you would get a kind of a, a completely sort of invariant lamination, these dynamical laminations, um, and uh, these, this sort of result of pinching along these laminations is a Cantor set in the plane. And topologically, the way in which that Cantor set in the plane braids around is exactly how the corresponding Julia sets associated to these polynomials braid around as we move around in the shift locus. Okay, so this is sort of a dynamical picture of given um, a location of these critical points, uh, you kind of pinch and you get the Julia sets moving in some nice way. Um, so this sort of all looks kind of pretty, pretty uh, fun, except that something quite interesting happens when you sort of take one of these critical leaves and you adjust its height. So I'm going to make this critical leaf a little bit smaller. So if I just move it like this, you can see there's a pre-critical leaf here, which is not moving. That's a pre-critical leaf, this one here. It's a pre-critical leaf of this big critical leaf here, which is fixed. So this guy is moving here and it gets it pushes over it. So that guy gets pushed aside. So there used to be a leaf that went from here to here, but that gets pushed aside, it gets pushed over this and now it moves from here to here. Well, on the other hand, what I can do is I can take this guy and I can shrink it down. And now, before he used to move past it, but now he, he can't move past it. He sort of hops from one side to the other. This red guy here is now shorter than this pre-critical leaf. So he gets pushed to the other side. He, he wants, he can't go through. The only way to go through is to grow longer and then go over the top. And then you can go through. And now if I go like that, you see I can pop around here and I do a sort of an interesting loop 
around here. And this is kind of giving me some non-trivial elements in pi one of the shift locus. I don't know if you can sort of see exactly all the action is happening in a, a few pixels on my screen, but uh, this is sort of how, how the picture sort of works. And meanwhile, these uh, uh, Julia sets over here are doing, their, are doing their kind of thing. All right, so um, let's sort of move to um, back to, to uh, some, some, uh, some mathematics. Uh, well, that was mathematics, but um, so let's sort of talk in a little bit more um, kind of uh, detail about what we're talking about. So every polynomial F is encoded combinatorially by a dynamical lamination. That's this sort of uh, picture here. Um, I'm not sure, I, I wish I had a pointer. So, uh, oh, great, it's not right. Um, this is the dynamical lamination, I guess. Um, and uh, so the result of kind of cutting and pasting uh, the exterior of the unit disk along the leaves of that lamination is to give a kind of a Riemann surface whose complement is typically a Cantor set, or it might be a finite unit of circles if you only cut and paste along, say, finitely many of these leaves. And that's, um, as the dynamical lamination varies, the Cantor set braids around in the complex plane. Um, and so there's some, some invariants associated to this combinatorial lamination. And one of them is something I'm calling the height. So um, these, this is of course a, a perfect, this is not just a kind of a, a schematic picture. It's also supposed to be an honest picture in the complex plane. The disc here is supposed to be the unit disc. And so these points, which are at the tip of these uh, critical leaves uh, are supposed to be complex numbers of absolute value uh, bigger than one. And so we call the height um, of a critical leaf is the log of the of the absolute value of this number. So just sort of basically, roughly speaking, it's the length of these sort of spikes, the tips um, of these. By the way, Danny, the, among the seven buttons, rightmost one is laser pointer, as you may know. If you yeah. Oh, this is you know Sam is Sam is teaching me how to how to teach on on Zoom. I've learned more. From him in the last two weeks than in a year of, of actually teaching over Zoom. All right, so so yeah, so these this this sort of point here um, is is this this sort of points here. The the log of the absolute values of these points um, is is sort of the height of these critical leaves. And now, if you think about it, there's a perfectly nice operation you can do on this picture, which is just to take all the critical leaves and simultaneously stretch them all by some common factor. Well, so the picture won't change at all combinatorially, the leaves will just get longer and it, it'll get longer in proportion. And if it was invariant under Z goes to Z to the D before, it's invariant under Z goes to Z to the D after. So um, the result of sort of doing this stretching um, is that you get a kind of an action of R star on the shift locus. So this is kind of a very nice simplification and it tells you that the shift locus is sort of a quotient of um, the real numbers, or if you like the positive real numbers, but topologically the same thing, um, by a space X sub D, which is a real manifold um, of real dimension one less than that of SD. So in the case of uh, degree three, the shift locus has real dimension four, so XD has real dimension three. So the shift locus is R times a three manifold. Okay. Um, so let's look at the case of degree three. So we have two critical leaves, each with angles two pi over three apart. And we're fixing one of these, fixing one of these C1, um, fixing the height of it at, let's say it's equal to one after quotienting out by this stretching thing, we can make the, the biggest one have height one, and then the next one have height strictly less than one. And you have two parameters. Basically you have the angle theta one, um, and the angle theta two, right? The two uh, angles associated to each of these leaves, uh, they differ by two pi over three. So, so there's sort of a canonical way to choose, let's say uh, the rightmost one. Um, and then the other one is, is sort of two pi over three to the, to the left of that. Um, and so those are the angles theta one and theta two. So theta one, theta two, and the height of C2 are three real parameters. Um, and they give you sort of, in a way, they give you global coordinates um, on this three manifold X sub three, uh, except the problem is that they do not vary continuously as a result, as, as a function of where you are in the shift locus. So 
these functions theta one, theta two, they're very nice functions on the space and they tell you exactly where you are, but they're not continuous. And the reason they're not continuous was exactly that phenomenon I sort of described before. Um, as I was moving C2 around, every time it got to a bigger leaf, which might have been C1, or it might have been one of its pre-images if C2 was sufficiently short, every time it got to a bigger leaf, it had to hop to the other side, okay? So there's sort of this discontinuity. So depending on the height of C2, the way in which the theta two parameter is parameterizes where you are, it's not, it doesn't give you sort of a single circle of parameters. The result is sort of a one manifold, which is sort of the result of taking this circle and cutting and pasting it along all these other leaves of bigger height, which get in the way. So there's sort of an interesting question, which is as we vary C2, as we move it around um, in, this, in this sort of uh, space, um, well, where we know, when we know what theta two is, as, uh, what, how do we know where the other leaves are? So we know that no matter what theta one and theta two are, there's a unique dynamical lamination, which has those leaves um, as, as critical leaves. Um, but exactly where all the other leaves are is kind of a complicated thing. And so as C2 moves around in, as a function of theta two, the location of the pre-critical leaves of C1 also vary in some complicated way. So when I run into a bigger leaf, I have to make a jump, but the location of the big leaves that I'm gonna run into, the location of the jumps and where I jump to, they are also moving as a function of where I am. So how do I figure out exactly uh, the combinatorial recipe that tells me how to cut and paste the space of coordinates to get a description of this uh, shift locus or, or its quotient X sub three. So the answer is, is this beautiful gadget called the tautological lamination. Um, so this is sort of a picture. So you get one tautological lamination for each um, value theta one of uh, the argument of the longer critical leaf. So C1, the critical leaf C1, remember that's been normalized to have height one and its, it's angle its angle is theta one. And in this, in this picture, I believe theta one is something like um, two pi over nine or so. Anyway, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's some, it's some nice uh, rational number. Um, and and uh, we fix that critical leaf and then we move the other critical leaf around. And we don't worry about the fact that motion in the space, um, the shift locus is discontinuous. We just act as though things are continuous. We just move the leaf C2 around to whatever location it is. And as we move it around, the location of the pre-critical leaves um, of the leaf C1 varies in some quite chaotic, uh, interesting combinatorial way. And then the way that we get the tautological lamination is as follows. So C1 is fixed and C2 is just moving around. It's doing its thing. I'm just varying it literally continuously. That's not how it would vary in the shift locus, but I'm just doing it anyway. And as it moves around, the pre-critical leaves of C1 hop in and out of existence, always somehow managing to avoid crossing the leaf C2. However, at certain kind of times, C2 will run into a pre-critical leaf of C1. At exactly the time that C2 runs into a pre-critical leaf of C1, we take that leaf of C1 and we add it to the tautological lamination. So you have a one parameter family of laminations depending on the location of C2. And the tautological lamination looks like the lamination in that family near the leaf C2. So you have a family of laminations and in those laminations, the leaf C2 is moving around. Wherever C2 is in that lamination, near that, you look at the leaf near that, and you take that leaf and you add that to the tautological lamination. So it's quite interesting. A priori, it's absolutely not obvious at all that the result is a lamination. We're adding a bunch of leaves from a collection of completely different laminations, and they're hopping around all over the place and a leaf that was here crosses a leaf in another lamination that's over here. But somehow this specially chosen family of leaves, one from each of these kind of laminations as we sort of move through this family, um, happens miraculously to manage to avoid themselves and they produce this embedded lamination, the tautological lamination. 
And these leaves of this tautological lamination have their own heights because of course they remembered their heights. They were pre-critical leaves. Um, so they remembered the heights that they had in the dynamical laminations that they lived in. And so you get one such lamination for every, comp for every argument theta one. So I should say, as theta one varies, the tautological laminations do not vary continuously. However, given a lamination, we can perform cut and paste and get a Riemann surface, which is topologically the plane minus a Cantor set. So it's a fact that as theta one varies, these plane minus a Cantor set, this family of Riemann surfaces, the sort of result of cutting along and pinching along that lamination, those Riemann surfaces do vary continuously. So we take these Riemann surfaces and let's say we kind of cut it off um, on some big disk, which encloses the tautological lamination. So instead of getting the plane minus a Cantor set, we just get a disk minus a Cantor set. So for every complex number, theta one in the unit circle, we get a disk minus a Cantor set, one parameter family of disks minus a Cantor set. So we get a bundle. We get a bundle over a circle, the S1 circle parameterized by theta one, whose fiber is the disk minus a Cantor set that you get by pinching the tautological lamination associated to the number theta one. Okay, so we have a surface bundle over a circle and the surfaces, the fibers, they're planar surfaces, they're just a disk minus a Cantor set. So topologically, the result is just, it's just a solid torus with a kind of a solenoid drilled out of it, right? Just this Cantor set, this braiding motion of this Cantor set uh, through this one, one parameter family, um, this circle's worth of location. So it's sort of uh, a solid torus with this sort of solenoid mapping, the mapping torus of, of this Cantor set, or well, uh, the, braided, the braidings of this Cantor set uh, drilled out of it. Um, and so the theorem is that the shift locus in degree three is a perfectly complete explicit model of it. It's homeomorphic to a product R times M. So M is a three manifold. What three manifold is it? Well, you take the three sphere, you drill out a right-handed trefoil so that there's a, a, a gap in S3, which is a solid torus. So it's S3 minus a solid torus, a neighborhood of a trefoil. And you glue in not a solid torus, but this sort of um, worm-eaten solid torus, this disk minus Cantor set bundle over S1, the sort of disk bundle N. So this is the gadget that you get. You glue that in where the trefoil was and the result is a nice open three manifold. It's a nice open subset of S3. That times R is um, a, a uh, common, is it homeomorphic uh, to the shift locus of degree three. So it's completely explicit. Um, so if you really want to sort of work with this in a very concrete way, well, you can say, I mean, a disk bundle, uh, a, a surface bundle is all very well, but what I really want to know is the monodrome. So the monodromy, so this is an element of the mapping class group of a disk minus a counter set. So the mon monodromy is very easy to describe. So remember, um, I sort of showed you pictures of when you have a nice lamination, well, they were dynamical laminations, but the principle is the same. When you have a nice lamination where the edges are kind of have filtered by length in this, in this kind of nice proper way, you have this canonical way of pinching it. You can kind of take the big leaf and pinch that off and the circle gets pinched into sort of two smaller circles, the top one and the bottom one. Then you take the next biggest leaves and pinch those, and the small circles get pinched off to smaller circles inside that, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you get this family of nested circles, and each of the circles is associated to a kind of a depth, which is these leaves are all kind of associated to pre-images of the critical leaf. Um, and so as we move the critical leaf around, as we vary the parameter theta one at some speed, the pre-critical leaf at depth n just moves at speed three to the minus n, right? The immediate pre-image just moves at speed a third, moves one third as fast. The pre-image of that moves at speed one ninth, the pre-image of that moves at speed one twenty-seventh, and so on. So the monodromy is very simple. You kind of have, the result is this sort of disk with sort of circles inside circles and circles inside circles and circles inside circles inside circles. But these are all round circles. And what you do is 
you just rotate these circles. You rotate the outer one at speed one, you rotate the next guys in at speed a third, you rotate the next guys at speed one ninth, speed one ninth, and so on and so forth all the way to infinity. And it's not at all obvious, by the way, that after time one, this picture will come back exactly to itself. But it does. That's a consequence of the fact that the monodromy is a, a map from this disk to itself. Um, so some of these circles here might get interchanged as you rotate this guy at speed, uh, as you rotate this circle at speed a third, it might, for instance, interchange this circle with this circle after time one. And each of these individual circles are themselves rotating at speed a ninth, and so on and so forth down off to infinity. And so once you know the combinatorics of the lamination, now you also know the monodromy, and so you know topologically exactly what the shift locus is uh, in degree three. Okay. Well, I was sort of uh, a little bit torn about how to proceed um, at this point. Um, the case of degree four uh, is, is very beautiful and, and also very complicated and has a whole host of, of new and interesting phenomena that occur. And some of the, of the general picture starts to emerge. Um, so for instance, um, one way to describe the topology of the shift locus in degree three is it's kind of a tree of spaces. So you kind of have a tree where the root is like the complement of the trefoil. Um, and then the next node in the tree is like uh, the part of the disk bundle in between the outer circle and the next circle, and then the next part of the tree are the sort of the pieces which are the parts in between the depth two circles and the depth three circles, and so on and so forth. So you have a kind of filtration um, of uh, your, your space by these pieces, and each piece is glued inside the hole in the, the previous piece, and this pattern of gluings uh, makes up a tree. Um, in higher degree, the kind of space of gluings is not a tree, uh, it's, it's a combinatorial ob object called a building, and it's a, it's a building of type uh, A sub D minus two, a contractible building of type A sub D minus two, if you know what that is. If you don't know what it is, that doesn't matter, it's sort of uh, beside the point. So rather than go on to higher degree, I thought I would sort of uh, take a complete left turn and spend the rest of the lecture very briefly talking about the other uh, uh, side of the, the title, which is the subject of sausages. So how do you make sausages? So here's this picture sort of explains uh, what's going. So here's how you make sausages. So somehow you have a machine that extrudes um, some kind of meat is being pushed into some, into some kind of like a, a, a sock, this long kind of sock made of like pig intestine or something like that. And the way you make sausages is you take a bunch of little ties and you tie off this thing every so often and take this long kind of cylindrical tube and chop it up into these compact little combinatorial pieces. Okay, so you know the great thing about mathematics is that um, mathematics will, will borrow metaphors from absolutely anywhere. Um, and, and this is, this is uh, one of the nice things about it. You can use your brain, which spends some of its time thinking about making sausages and use the same brain to think about uh, doing mathematics and sometimes with interesting results. And so here's something you can do. Well, we have a combinatorial for two set, which is after all a Riemann surface. Uh, it's topologically something like um, a, a, a plane with a counter set removed, um, but we can sort of draw it in this sort of vertical way where uh, up near infinity, um, it's, so this is sort of in these Bircher coordinates where we're measuring things with the vertical coordinate is this coordinate H, which is sort of the log of the absolute value of the, of, of the coordinate where we were uh, on the exterior of the unit disk. When we do cut and paste, that coordinate is still perfectly good. It's, a, it's the Green's function of the, of the Julia set, if you, if you know what that is, but it doesn't really matter if you don't know. So there's a way of kind of arranging your Riemann surface. So it's sort of vertical, it looks like a cylinder up at positive infinity, but then after a while, after you pass a critical point, kind of branches and it, it, quite, it, it changes from a cylinder into a pair of pants, and then the cuffs acquire their own pant legs and they, they bifurcate and they bifurcate and they bifurcate 
uh, on and on towards a catasect. Well, you can make sausages, which just means at a sequence of vertical heights, which are invariant under the action of this z goes to the z to the d, you can just tie these things off and cut them up. And this Riemann surface, this infinite type Riemann surface, gets cut up into a collection of, well, very nice Riemann surfaces. In fact, these Riemann surfaces are just um, copies of CP1. So what we're doing is sort of replacing this infinite uh, Riemann, infinite type Riemann surfaces, this for two set, this a priori transcendental object with a kind of um, uh, pro-finite algebraic object, this sort of tree of um, uh, CP1. So it's like an, it's a nodal genus zero curve, except that the, the tree goes on forever. So it's kind of like a, uh, a, a, a some kind of, of direct limit of nodal uh, Riemann surfaces of genus zero. So this is called um, making sausages. And we can define a sausage shift polynomial as follows. So first of all, it's a rooted tree of sausages. Okay, so you have a rooted tree, and for every vertex, you have a sausage. Okay, so far, so good. Well, every sausage is really a CP1. I mean, they look like sausages here, but after all, combinatorially, they're just a sphere. So every sausage is really a CP1. The sausage really refers to the idea of cutting off this Riemann surface at various stages to, to tie it off into these nice compact uh, bite-sized pieces. So every sausage is a CP1. Every sausage gets a polynomial map associated to it. So where did that come from? Well, our original Riemann surface had some dynamics, either the map F, if we were this was literally the Fatou set, or the map Z goes to Z to the D, if this was um, our butcher model of the, of the Fatou set. So when we cut it off, um, our, our quotient Riemann surface also has some dynamics. Well, above a certain point, this sort of thing is just a sequence of very boring sausages and each sausage just sort of maps to the next one in a kind of boring way. And so these maps are just sort of z goes to z to the d once we go above a certain height. So we kind of throw this away. We kind of throw the sort of redundant bit apart and we think of our uh, quotient Riemann surface. We only start at the first interesting sausage, the one that contains the critical point of largest height. So there has to be at least one critical point in the top sausage. So it's a, it's a rooted tree and the root sausage has at least one honest critical point in it. And so we have a family of polynomial maps. So every sausage gets a polynomial map and it's a polynomial map, not from the sausage to itself, but from the sausage to the next sausage up or, or one sausage above it in the tree or some, a sausage at the next height in it in the tree. So the top one sort of goes nowhere this one sort of just gets a polynomial without its receptacle being anywhere, just somehow its receptacle is just an abstract CP1, just gets a polynomial. This guy gets a polynomial map from this sausage to that sausage. This guy gets a polynomial map to that sausage. This guy gets a polynomial map to um, here. This one, I guess, gets a polynomial map to here. This one gets a polynomial map to here. This one gets a polynomial map to here, and so on and so forth. So you get these little nodes here. The nodes at the top level, the attaching points at the top level are the zeros of the polynomial associated to the top sausage. The nodes at previous levels are just the pre-images of the nodes at the top level under these poly polynomial maps. We pull them back. And um, the way in which we figure out what the degrees of these maps are, so these are polynomial maps and we normalize them. So they're of the form z to the some degree plus some constant times z to the, that, the degree minus two plus dot, dot, dot. So these are normalized polynomials. And the way we decide what degree they are is, well, every one of these attaching maps gets a kind of multiplicity, which is, um, if it's a critical point, then we get the multiplicity is one plus its multiplicity is a critical point. So if you have a, a simple critical point, this guy is gonna map by degree two. If this failed to be a critical point, this guy would map by degree one. Um, if this was a critical point of multiplicity two, this guy would map by degree three and so on and so forth. And so there are some critical points that are special. So there are critical points that happen to lie at these nodes. Those are not so special, but then there are critical points that happen to their genuine critical points. 
uh, and their pre-images, but the genuine critical points that happen to lie uh, in the interior of the sausages, not at these sort of special marked points, those you actually count. And in order to be a sausage polynomial, a shift polynomial, we have to have exactly D minus one critical points counted with multiplicity, genuine critical points added up over all of these sausages. So all the critical points that are not at nodes, you count them up with multiplicity, you should get D minus one. And then, well, you get a counter set of ends and you can, you can just check that under this hypothesis or well, the dynamics of this polynomial map from this sort of tree of sausages to itself acts as a D to one map on the set of ends to itself. So the set of ends is a counter set and the action on the set of ends is topologically conjugate to the shift on a D letter alphabet. So these are genuine sort of shifts in the sense of shift polynomials. So the dynamics of these sausage shifts on their ends of the tree is exactly the way a shift polynomial acts on its Julia set up to, up to topological conjugacy. Okay, so these are the correct sort of combinatorial gadgets um, to that, that, that are, are correspond to uh, polynomials in the shift locus. So the theorem, if you need a theorem, is if we look at sausages of a fixed combinatorial type, they're parameterized by a quasi-projective variety. Um, that's sort of not so difficult. It turns out that for all but finitely many sausages, the degrees of these maps are always one. And since these maps are normalized, the only map of degree one is just Z goes to Z. So there's sort of no information in contained in these polynomial maps uh, for all except finitely many of them. So once we fix a sort of a combinatorial type, um, the data of this uh, sausage polynomial is just described by a finite collection of honest polynomials. And the coefficients of those polynomials are subject to some algebraic constraints and so the set of such things is in a very natural way um, an algebraic variety, quasi-projective variety. In fact, they're, they're quite special. They're basically these generalized discriminant complements. Um, and second of all, theorem, you can recover the homeomorphism type of the shift locus basically by taking these sausage varieties, these quasi-projective varieties, which parameterize these sausage maps, and just gluing them together in somehow the most obvious possible way. So there's a description of the shift locus. So it is a complex manifold, but a highly transcendental one. But topologically, we have a completely different description of it as an increasing union of algebraic varieties. So that's not a holomorphic parameterization. So this sort of correspondence between the shift locus and this sort of sausage coordinates, you know, this, this building, you know, these parameter spaces of sausage polynomials, it's a homeomorphism, but very far from being uh, a complex map, not even a complex analytic map. Uh, but at least combinatorially, you can recover uh, everything from, from this sort of picture. So I wanted to end by sort of just showing you in a few cases exactly how this, this works out. So the degree two case. So maybe I'll just sort of re re reconstruct from scratch um, the degree two case so you could sort of see what the rules are if you didn't digest them. And I apologize because it probably went by very fast. So we're going to get a tree of Riemann surfaces a tree of CP1s. And so it's a rooted tree. So at the top, we just have a node and we have infinity because this is a copy of CP1 and there's a polynomial attached to that. And the polynomial is gonna be of degree two because um, we're looking at degree two. So we have a polynomial and it's normalized. So it's a polynomial of the form Z goes to Z squared plus some constant. And remember, I, I said that um, we don't want to have any redundant sort of simple nodes at the top of our tree. We want the very top node to have this sort of um, uh, sort of non-triviality property that there has to be at least one critical point, which is not a root of the polynomial. So there must be, so there must be some um, critical point not equal to a root. Well, the roots are plus or minus um, the square root, sorry. Uh, uh, what are they? Uh, maybe I should make it z squared minus c. Uh, so the roots are plus or minus the square root of c. And the critical point is zero. So I just better have that zero is not equal to c. So zero is not equal to c. Okay. And so I have two roots 
and the two roots are at the square root of c and minus the square root of c. And at each of those roots, I attach the next node. And now, since these are not critical points, they have multiplicity one. Remember, the multiplicity is one plus their multiplicity is a critical point if they were critical points. There is a critical point. So I'm going to write, draw the actual honest critical points in the middle, sort of in green. So zero is critical. But it's an honest critical point. So you do have an honest critical point there at zero. Um, and since these guys have multiplicity one, that says that the next node down maps by a polynomial of degree one. And there is only one normalized polynomial of degree one, namely z. Well, so it just pulls back the pre-image, root c minus root c, are just the locations of the next nodes. Root c, the next nodes, and so on and so forth. So you just get this sort of binary tree, infinite binary tree. Every CP1 is attached at infinity at the top to, um, and at the bottom at root, root c and minus root c to its, its two children. And so sort of heads off to infinity and, uh, you know, so the Cantor set is just a sort of like usual binary Cantor set. Um, and the polynomial map just takes everything up to the next guy, just acts as sort of the expanding, the, the standard expanding map of degree two from this dyadic Cantor set to itself. So it's just the shift on the, uh, the two letter uh, infinite, right infinite sequence alphabet. So this is the only possibility. And so the space of possibilities is, well, what are the moduli here? The only modulus is the value of this complex number C, and the only constraint on it is that C is not equal to zero. So the space is just the complex numbers minus zero. And the complex numbers minus zero is homeomorphic to S2. And remember, it's not holomorphic. C S2 is a holomorphic manifold, and C minus zero is a holomorphic manifold, a complex manifold, but they are not isomorphic as complex manifolds. C minus zero is I mean, it is what it is. Uh, S2 is a punctured disk. It's not a punctured plane. It's not a punctured plane. Those are holomorphically different. But they are homeomorphic. They're both annular. So you can recover the topology in the degree two case um, just from, just from uh, this very simple picture. So degree three is a little bit more complicated, but actually not much more complicated. The top stratum, we have... Um, Maybe I'll just, again, I'll just erase this and, and, and redo it, just so you can sort of see me uh, think in real time. So at the top level, infinity, we have some polynomial P, uh, which is, so it's going to be a cubic. So it's going to be Z cubed plus um, PZ plus Q. Um, and in order for it not to be degenerate, we can't have both P and Q be equal to zero. Uh, so equivalently, there must be at least two distinct roots. So the simplest case is that, so the simplest case, so this is the top stratum, simplest case is that there are three distinct roots. Say so Z1 z2 z3 and then there are two honest critical points and they are wherever they are remember the critical points were there in green and since this polynomial has been normalized um, the sum of the zi uh, is equal to zero um, and uh, so we have these three points um, so this is sort of three distinct roots that's equivalent to saying minus 4 p cubed minus 27 q squared uh, is not equal to zero. So this is C2 minus the discriminant locus. And once we know that, well, these three points all have multiplicity one. So we just have a Riemann surface attached, which is just mapping by degree one. So everything is just maps by the identity map. And you just have this boring kind of tree. There's no more data. So this stratum here just gives us um, C squared minus uh, the discriminant locus. So this is, of course, uh, homeomorphic to R times S3 minus the right-handed trefoil. So this is the top stratum in our combinatorial description of the shift locus in degree three, which is just as well because they're supposed to be describing the same space. 
Well, then there's a degeneration that occurs when let's say um, Z2 equals Z1. So you only get, so you get two critical, so you get two roots now at Z1 and Z2. And because Z1 is a double root, it's also a critical point of degree one. So the multiplicity at Z1 is two and the multiplicity at Z2 is one. And there's one critical point, uh, honest critical point floating in the middle there somewhere. And so the next stratum says, so you're gonna get a degree two map from the node um, attached at this point, the node attached at Z1 maps by a degree two map, which we can put in the form Z squared plus C. So um, the non-degeneracy condition is that both of the points Z1 and Z2 have four, have each of them separately has two distinct uh, pre-images because that's the condition that there's another critical point there somewhere in the middle. And so you notice there are, there's two critical green critical points uh, in, in this case, both in the top node. So it's degree three because there are two critical points and none anywhere else. Here we have one critical point in the top node, one in the node directly below it. And so the configuration space here is that, well, Z1 and Z2 are two complex numbers. Z1 is a double root, Z2 is a single root, and the sum of the roots is zero. So Z2 is minus two Z1. So the configuration at the top level is just the space, uh, the complex uh, punctured, com punctured complex line, C minus zero. And then for every value of Z1 not equal to zero, um, C has to have uh, one of, the following two properties, it can't be equal to Z1 or to Z2. So the structure of this thing is uh, a fiber bundle. It's a fiber bundle over the base space, which is C minus zero, and the fiber is C minus two points. So over the point Z1, you look at C minus the two points Z1 and minus Z2 Z1. So this is C2 minus the zero locus of this nice reducible polynomial X, Y minus X, y plus 2x equals zero. So it's a perfectly nice uh, variety. Um, and if you think about it, that's uh, a pair of pants bundle over a punctured disc, which up to homotopy is a pair of pants bundle over a circle, which is sort of a solid torus with um, a kind of, well, I mean, it depends on the monodromy, and, and, but it turns out two sort of solid tori drilled out of the interior. And that gets glued in to the trefoil, which is the complement of uh, the stratum at the top level. And then if we look at each further degeneration, we get uh, these combinatorial uh, uh, sausages give us uh, collections of, of algebraic varieties, which if we sort of compute what they are topologically, each one describes the piece that's glued in to the previous piece. And the union of all these pieces gives you a nice combinatorial description um, of the shift locus, which on the one hand is sort of in a way exactly the same as the combinatorial description that came from these dynamical laminations and the tautological lamination. On the other hand, it's sort of a completely different description and, and the information in it is encoded in quite a different way. And I think it would be an extremely interesting question to, to sort of try to analyze uh, exactly the relationships between these two pictures, use the fact that they are both describing the same, the same sort of space to give you some, some quite interesting uh, uh, and unexpected topological descriptions um, of these rather natural uh, algebraic varieties. All right, so I'm out of time and that's sort of really more or less uh, uh, the end of the introduction to sausages and sort of all I wanted to, to say in this sort of introductory uh, lectures. Uh, Sam has very kindly invited me uh, to write a kind of expository paper uh, on, on some of this material. So I'm hoping to have that uh, finished in, in the next couple of months and, and, and we'll make that uh, available. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, I hope uh, you found that sort of interesting. Um, I'm gonna stop there. Yo, thank you very much for the talk. I didn't know my video was off. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great pleasure for us to, to listen to your talk today. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Uh, so, 
So if if we consider the some uh, rational map, so if we have a pool, then there is is there some parallel theory or is there some any obstacle to proceed? Okay, so you can talk about instead of polynomials, you could talk about rational maps, and and so of course the the combinatorics can be can be quite complicated. Um, um, one can still ask for for something nice, some nice property like, for instance, um, that that you know the Julia set is a Cantor set or something or something like that. Um, uh, most of the time, that will that will sort of uh, 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 tend to tend to sort of give. Uh, some very strong kind of constraints on what's going on. Um, but you could have, for instance, that the for two set is homeomorphic to the complement uh, to, to a sphere minus uh, a counter set. And that, that could be, you could have sort of macroscopic components um, on the you know, connected components of the complement. But so uh, in that case, it would be, it would be uh, you could have some interesting sort of dynamics. I think um, sort of in a case by case basis, in every case, you can sort of do some some sort of version of of the of the the story here. The polynomial case is very nice because you have this super attracting fixed pointed infinity. So you have Birch's theorem that you have this nice holomorphic conjugacy to z goes to z to the d um, at that point, and you can analytically continue that throughout the entire component and get kind of global co co you know coordinates on the for two set. Um, but in principle, there's nothing sort of stopping you from from uh, producing sort of one butcher co coordinate sort of uh, case by case on each um, uh, attracting or uh, component or, they, or their pre-images um, and then tr somehow trying to sew together that information with the combinatorics of how all the different components are, are kind of permuted. Um, and then within each component, then there's analysis in terms of these sort of dynamical laminations, uh, which is sort of runs parallel to the story for the shift locus. Um, and by the same token, you can you can still perform this sort of sausage operation and describe the, the combinatorics again uh, in this sort of nice combinatorial method using algebraic geometry. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things you could say. The bookkeeping will be more complicated and you'll sort of get one picture for each sort of component or whatever and how they all sort of fit together globally might be more complicated and, and, and more challenging to understand. But, but there's sort of some, some kind of... Uh, uh, residual uh, parameter that, that, that sort of comes from this picture. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good question. I, I don't know anyone that's done any work in that direction. I think it would be uh, pretty interesting to, to work out some details and some, some interesting cases. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, so in your sausage variety, so can we, there's, is, that, uh, is there any explanation about the uh, mapping class group, a big mapping class group of disk minus contour set by, uh, through your sausage variety? I think when we yeah. kind of... Uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah, yes, there, yes, there is, right? Because you can think of, um, if you truncate your sausage at some finite stage, the set of components of that are a sort of some approximation. I mean, the ends are, are, of course, the limit as you go out to infinity, truncate at some finite stage and see how these sort of sausages are all sort of moving around. That gives you some finite approximation. So, so you have these algebraic varieties, which are in fact describing braiding of um, finite collections of points uh, in the plane. And this, these collections of points are some kind of approximation of the Julia set. And so you can kind of get a description of the monodromy uh, at the end uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, sequences of braid groups of higher and higher degree. Uh, that's actually one of, the, one of the key reasons why I, I kind of wanted to, to sort of re recast it sort of in, this, in, these, in these terms. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah. And by the way, be precisely because of this picture, um, it tells you that if you look at the strata down to some finite stage, the image of the mapping class group, um, the image in the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set, well, whatever group that is, as an abstract group, um, it factors through a homomorphism to a finite braid group. So the, the whole of pi one somehow sees more and more interesting um, uh, dynamics of the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set, but each compact subset of, of the shift locus the fundamental group of that compact subset, that's the image of that 
in the, in the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set factors through a map to a finite break group. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So does it make any sense to consider uh, outside shift locus of uh, polynomials having finite orbits in the positive direction of the critical points? Oh, um, yeah, so, so of course, um, yeah, if you think of, let's look at the degree two case. So the Mandelbrot set uh, is the complement of the degree two case. Um, and and as, as sort of you probably know, as, as the picture here of the Mandelbrot set somewhere, uh, the Mandelbrot set sort of, sort of uh, decomposes in some nice way into a bunch of kind of blobs. Ooh, that's not what I wanted to do. You kind of have the blobs, you kind of have this main cardioid and you have these little blobs, blob, blob, blob. And each one of these blobs uh, corresponds to has sort of a, a kind of a nice point in the middle of it, which corresponds to a polynomial, which is post critically finite. So meaning that the, 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 the critical point, which in this case is zero, maybe it's not periodic, but it's pre periodic. It sort of eventually goes into some periodic orbit. And depending on the combinatorics of that, of that sort of finite order orbit, that describes the sort of the set of these round blobs in the Mandelbrot set. And conjecturally, the Mandelbrot set is the closure of all of these uh, blobs, but that sort of depends on issues like whether the Mandelbrot set is locally connected or not, which I guess people believe that it is, but I, I don't have a strong, I, I, I don't know enough to be able to, to guess. But in any case, that's sort of, yeah, that's sort of right. Um, you can certainly do a similar thing with the shift locus. So you can sort of look at the case that say maybe one, cat, one critical point escapes off to infinity and then the other one doesn't. And you can sort of fix the combinatorics of the other one by making it post critically finite with some sort of fixed combinatorics. And then you'll get a kind of a picture which is sort of analogous um, and, and is, is sort of corresponds to sort of the case of uh, polynomial um, of lower degree, right? Because one of the degrees of freedom, uh, namely the combinatorics of your post critically finite, of, of, of your critical point, which is doing its, its sort of thing, that's sort of been fixed. So then you only have, you have one sort of fewer degree of freedom for the location of the rest of it. So that's, that's a, yeah, there's an analogous picture that you can, you can describe in that case. Yeah. I mean, by the way, in the case of the Mandelbrot set, you're reducing to a single point, which is like the case of degree one, but in the, in the, in the, in the analog of the shift locus, the complement of these cardioids would be um, themselves sort of spaces which are kind of analogous to the shift locus of degree two. Uh, degree two. Uh, so they, yeah, sorry. Uh, may I ask you to explain me once again how to construct the topological lamination? Please. Yeah, so the topological lamination. Let me just sort of let me just draw. A, um, go back to let's let's go back to um, uh, the program here. So uh, I spent so many hours on this beautiful program. Um, okay, so the picture here is. Okay, so we have one um, critical leaf, which is fixed, yeah? And then the other one, the shorter one is moving around. And as the short one moves around, the pre-critical leaves of the big one change. So as, as I move around, it changes somehow. And so it's moving around, it's changing in some kind of quite complicated way. Um, and every so often I run into a pre-critical leaf of the big guy. Well, every time I run into a pre-critical leaf of the big guy, I record where that leaf was and what it looked like, and I put that leaf in the tautological lamination. There's, there's a kind of a little wrinkle, which is I only pay attention to this one third of the circle, the part in here, and I kind of take the laminate, the leaf in there, and I sort of multiply it by three. So I take that circle, this sort of arc here, which is length is a third, and I stretch it over an entire circle. So it's all the leaves that I'm running into kind of on the on this side of the thing, they're kind of on this arc. I multiply them by three, and I get an arc in a circle three times as big, so a unit circle. So that's the definition of the of the tautological lamination, with associated to the parameter, which is the location 
of the other critical leaf. So for each location of this other critical leaf, for each angle theta in the circle, you get a tautological lamination. And as this parameter varies, the tautological laminations vary by, well, the leaves move at a certain speed. This one moves at speed one, the pre-critical leaves at depth D move it at speed D. And when a big one moves over at speed three to the minus D, when a big one moves over a smaller one, it gets pushed over. So that, that sort of tells you, first of all, what all the tautological laminations are and how they're related to each other for different values of, of theta. Thank you. Oh, so someone asked a question. Um, Wan Te Huang asked, does it make sense to work with polynomials with coefficients in an algebraically closed field other than the complex numbers um, or non-algebraically closed fields? Um, I think the answer is, it makes sense, and it's probably an extremely good question, but, but very far from my domain of ex, uh, expertise. But what I will say, actually, is that these sort of monodromy groups that arise um, in, in uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 sausage, the sausage varieties, where they're described as sort of um, sometimes monodromy, uh, sometimes they're described as bundles and things are moving in certain kind of uh, monodromy, um, the monodromies groups are basically uh, kind of Galois groups of, of function fields of, of, these, of these varieties. So uh, it would make perfect sense to work over other fields and, and uh, for which the Galois groups are still sort of well-defined and maybe quite different from, from these sort of more topological versions of Galois groups that are sort of braid type groups. Um, and so one could talk about the monodromy uh, mapping class, in place of map mapping class groups, you would have uh, various sort of uh, interesting Galois groups um, associated to your, your, your field that, that you're working in. I think that'd be an extremely interesting uh, thing to do. I don't really know much about it, uh, but, I, but I, I, I would love to uh, learn uh, about if, if someone were to, to do it, I think, I think it would be extremely interesting mathematics. Okay, uh, any other comments or questions? So if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>